Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of iChart TV. In 2013, a Dominican Republic's court ruling left thousands of people of Asian descent stateless. Today, in the Dominican Republic, over a hundred thousand people are living without a nationality. Today, I'm interviewing Bridget Wooding, who is the director of the Observatory of Mika, which is now carrying out research to improve public policy in the country. Mrs. Wooding is going to share with us her insight into the impact that COVID-19 is having on stateless people in the Dominican Republic. Bridget Wooding, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. <laughs> How are stateless people in the Dominican Republic affected by the outbreak of the virus? What is the humanitarian impact that you have seen so far? Yes, the, the situation is worrying in the context of the archipelago of the insular Caribbean, in that the Dominican Republic has the worst outbreak. The health facilities are, are, not, are not brilliant. The government is not as well organized as it might be. Um, so, questions of uh, contract tracing, uh, questions of uh, really uh, making sure that things are effectively controlled before the economy starts up fully. The impact of COVID-19 is, is very serious because there was a grave situation for stateless people before um, COVID-19, especially since uh, 2013 when over 130,000 Dominicans, mainly of Haitian ancestry, uh, had been denationalized. So what happens when people are stateless is that they don't have access to the normal series of rights that you or I may have in terms of education or health or social protection. And social protection is extremely important uh, when the health crisis happens. Uh, because what the Dominican government did, as many go governments have done, is to immediately introduce a whole series of measures, uh, which include confinement, include curfew, include state of emergency. And so many people are unable to do what they normally do in order to, to, to gain a living. You mentioned that many stateless people in the Dominican Republic have Asian descent. How did they become stateless? Yeah, the issue of... Uh, Dominican Haitian relations is one that goes back a long time. Uh, now, um, Haitian migrant labor, people started to come across to the Dominican Republic uh, a century ago. And this was accelerated when the US, the United States, occupied both countries in the 1920s, 30s of the last century. And they encouraged the sugar industry in the Dominican Republic and they encouraged Haitians to come across and work in the sugar industry. Um, and with the decline of the sugar industry in the 80s, now Haitians are to be found in every niche of the Dominican economy, basically doing bottom most jobs that Dominicans don't want to do or go overseas in order to get pay, better paid to, to do them. Now, up until the middle of the 80s, between the early 50s and the mid 80s, there, there were um, interstate agreements which governed how this migrant labor happened. But in the middle of the 80s, when the Duvalier dictatorship, Baby Doc, collapsed in Haiti, these agreements uh, collapsed. And since then, there's been irregular migration. In 2013, the Constitutional Tribunal took a decision uh, which attempted to denationalize people of uh, foreign ancestry going back to 1929, um, alleging that those people who had a regular status um, should not have the right to give Dominican nationality to their children born in country. So this is where it all starts from. And we have to remember that Haitians are the single largest migrant collective. They're 87% of all immigrants and most likely not to have their papers in, in order. How many stateless people are currently living in the Dominican Republic? What the UNHCR calculated was that there were over 130,000 persons that had been made stateless. Now, according to official figures under the operation of the law 169, just under 30,000 people have been enabled to have their papers back. That's to say people who had their papers but were stripped of them. 
The case is much more worrying for those people who have never had access to documents, even under the Constitution when they were born, they should have had that access. So we're talking about at least over 100,000 people in that situation when uh, children are born to parents whose situation may be um, under discussion. Uh, often they end up undocumented and risk statelessness in turn. So it becomes intergenerational. International governments advise is to stay home, wear a mask and social distance. How is this even possible if you don't have a home, an income or if you live in slums? This virus has exacerbated the living conditions of many people. Tell me more about it. Yes, I live in a very mixed area on the outskirts of Santo Domingo where I'm speaking to you, to, to you today, from today. And people here um, don't have the conditions to engage in social distancing. They don't have the uh, conditions to engage in all the hygiene measures necessary. And sometimes um, they assume that it's a disease for the rich because of the way in which it has been globally transmitted and don't yet necessarily understand um, the importance of all the measures that are being um, recommended by, by the government. One and a half million Dominicans receiving social protection assistance before COVID-19 and these people automatically uh, were eligible for a special humanitarian aid program. So not only was there this humanitarian aid program for a considerable number of people, but there have been two further programs that have been initiated. Uh, one was which is for those people who were employed in the private sector and were laid off, and now these are eligible for a, a state assistance. And more recently, a program for informal sector workers, um, remembering that most people in the Dominican Republic work in the informal sector. The problem is, that with all these programs, what is essential is an identity document. And that's precisely what stateless people do not have. Stateless people have been excluded by economic relief programs set up by the Dominican Republic government. Tell me more about it. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Uh, and because uh, and most people in the Dominican public, including these more vulnerable sectors, work in the informal sector, that means that they're obliged uh, to go out every day and look for work. And this obviously is something which is incompatible with um, quarantine, it's incompatible sometimes with curfews, it's incompatible with states of emergency. So we have um, uh, this, this, this issue. Um, so um, there was some graffiti in Santo Domingo which said, um, coronavirus or, or we eat. So it's a question of um, people trying to decide where their best interests lie. And if there is no humanitarian aid, if there is no support for these workers, um, then they may put themselves in situations of, uh, of danger where there's no social distancing happening uh, and so on. Even in those so-called um, essential jobs, and here, essential jobs include agriculture, for example, working in sugarcane, working in bananas. The government has issued a series of guidelines saying what should happen so that health standards are applied. But in practice, what human rights organizations have been monitoring is that doesn't always happen. So there isn't the distance that there should be. There are the hygiene measures that should take place either in the workplace or in the communities where, where these workers are living. Many stateless people around the world are unable to get health care if they fall ill with coronavirus or if they experience any other medical issue because they have no nationality or because they're simply not considered a priority. Is it the case in the Dominican Republic? Yes, the, the Dominican Republic um, does give access to everybody in the country to health services. However, this may be done on a discriminatory basis and this may be done uh, where you have um, people who can have access to private health care, people who have access to public health care and then um, the people who have access to public health care, those who come last on the list are people who don't have 
um, in, in health insurance and they're people who may be migrants or descendants of migrants. So it's a problem. The Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion's report has found that birth registration has been suspended in many countries across the world. This poses a huge threat to the high numbers of people that are already stateless. Has this happened in the Dominican Republic as well? But what's happened um, with um, all the workers being laid off and social distancing was that for um, some weeks uh, normal civil registry procedures were not available. Now people have been told that they can now apply for late birth registration procedures. The problem is that these are much more complicated and much more expensive and so maybe a deterrent for people to actually think about doing this when they have far more other things on their plate at the moment. So our worry is that this is going to have collateral effects and that for the future uh, more young people could be uh, at risk of being stateless. What has been the government's response so far? Has any support been provided to stateless people? Urgent humanitarian aid has been sought for those most vulnerable people, including stateless people. And at the same time, there's been a big lobby so that the state should include these people independently of their documentary status. Has the government made any statement related to the stateless community? This is the worrying issue. So while there have been representations made from the affected people themselves, from the organizations advocating for their rights, the government has been quite coy in terms of defer, uh, referring specifically to migrants or their descendants born in the Dominican Republic with a right to Dominican nationality. And this is probably partly to do with the political moment that we're in, because we're in a pre-electoral period. We're coming up for presidential uh, Congress elections uh, on the 5th of July. And the Haiti issue is always a very kind of delicate issue. No political party wants to refer to it. Um, and so it's not in the interests of the governing party to indicate that they're making any, uh, any concessions. Soft diplomacy, soft advocacy is going on with a view to having a whole list of revindications uh, that need to be taken forward with the new authorities uh, when they take power in the middle of August. So we're in a quite complicated moment in that sense. What is the general stance of the Dominican Republic towards stateless people living in the country? Uh, national human rights defenders were supported regionally um, by uh, organizations like uh, Sahil, based in Washington, um, like the Network on Statelessness um, for the Americas, also by the uh, Institute, the International Institute on Statelessness um, and Inclusion, amongst others. And this international regional support meant that the government, the Dominican state, was forced to rethink things. And in rethinking things, um, what happened was that um, they adopted a legislation, the so-called uh, Naturalization Law 169, um, about six months uh, or so after the um, tribunal constitutional decision. And this divided people into two groups, where one group, uh, those people who already had their papers, they'd been stripped of them, were supposed to get back their papers immediately. And the second group, which never had papers, but which under the constitution where they were born should have had papers, were supposed to go through a process leading to eventual naturalization. Now, the official figures show that only uh, just under 30,000 people have managed to regain their papers and nobody in the group B, those people who had never had their papers but were going to be naturalized, have um, managed to finish that process, which is very worrying because we're talking about the recent sixth anniversary of this legislation when it was supposed to be something which was opportune and, and agile. So um, for us, while the legislation is there, it has been applied too timidly, and it also needs to be supported by additional measures, probably supplementary legislation, and certainly uh, more political will for it to be properly implemented. 
What urgent action needs to be taken by the Dominican Republic to respond to the fundamental needs and rights of stateless people in the country? I think this is tied up with the larger questions of recognizing international obligations. However, for the moment, I think what the government, what the authorities need to understand is that um, if this particular group of vulnerable people is not included, everybody is at risk. With a health crisis, we can't just exclude one population because that puts at risk everybody. And the Dominican Republic is a country which is largely dependent on tourism. It cannot afford to have a bad name. Um, I cannot afford not to contain, control and eventually eradicate the virus. Um, and so even without being altruistic, um, the state needs to take on board that every vulnerable group, including the stateless, have to be have to be included. And this means initially engaging in humanitarian aid, social protection programs that confront the virus, but over the longer term, ensuring that those people who have the right to Dominican documentation have their process to regain it or gain it, speed it up, so that for the rem remaining part of this crisis and any other com crisis which the country may confront, um, we can be better placed to do so. Bridget Wooding, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you for being with us for another episode of IHR TV. From myself, Margherita Cargasacchi, until next time, goodbye.